Next, I would love to introduce Mara Kessling. Kiesling. Um, Mara is the founder and executive director for the National Center for Transgender Equality. Mara. My mic just fell off. Um, the problem is, honestly, my, none of my clothes fit. I'm going to need to borrow that Miami suit. <laughs> um, no, I, so m none of my clothes fit right now. I um, have this workout buddy, and we always work out together. And she went out and took up CrossFit. So I went out and took up Spanx. Um, <laughs> And nothing, <laughs> my clothes aren't fitting. No, I've, I've actually been eating well and losing weight, and none of my clothes fit, and my mic just fell right off me. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mara Kiesling from the National Center for Transgender Equality. I'm so happy to be here today. This is my first, uh, my first conference, and I'm super excited to be here. Um, I, while I am not in the travel industry, I am a very frequent traveler. Um, until this year, I was a Diamond member at Hilton, and then last year just fell a little short. Hilton, if you're here, talk to me. <laughs> and I know you're here. Um, uh, but I, I, I've been trying to think about what I wanted to talk about, and I, and I do seriously want to talk a little bit about traveling while transgender. Um, it's, it's very different. It's one of the areas so NCTE, the National Center for Transgender Equality, is primarily a policy organization. And one of the things we say is that the, everything in the gay agenda is part of the trans agenda, but then we have some other things too, like ID documents, like access to transition-related health care, um, access to sex-segregated facilities, and things like that. But in, there's a couple areas, and travel is one of those, where traveling while trans is very different than traveling while gay. It's kind of like when kids are in school. I, I always say that being the parent of a, of a trans kid is less like being the parent of a gay kid than it is being the parent of a kid with special health care needs. Because you have to be working with the school constantly on access, not just things like bullying, not just things like who do we get to date, but, but which programs do the kids get to participate in? Can they do sports? What facilities do they use? And, and travel is another area where traveling while trans is very different than traveling while, um, while gay. Now, before I talk about this, I want you to remember that lots of gay people are trans and lots of trans people are gay. So I will be shortcutting here and saying gay people and trans people, but lots of people, including myself, identify as both trans and gay. Um, when you're traveling as trans, or when you're thinking of promoting to transgender people for traveling, it's often less about, uh, when, when I see um, gay travel ads, it's usually about be with other gay people. And, and that's not what it's really about for trans people. For trans people, it's about safety. Um, it's about where, where you will be safe in terms of your ID documents, where you'll be safe in terms of um, access to facilities. And so I'm just going to talk uh, about some of my experiences while traveling to, to give you some idea. I, um, sh shortly after I transitioned um, in 2000, I went to the passport office and they happily stamped on my passport on the first endorsement page, this person has changed their sex from male to female. That meant I couldn't travel to most countries in the world immediately. So that was one of the first things that NCTE worked on when it was founded, and now they don't do that. Um, now they just change it, and there's no obvious record of that on the passport itself. But you can imagine my mother was really freaked out about my passport. Um, she knew I wouldn't be safe potentially anywhere. Interestingly, the only uh, borders I ever had trouble with that was getting back into the United States, um, which I have found to be where I, where I have the most trouble. Um, but, but, ID, but, but passports are really an important thing, but other kinds of travel documents, and just if you're traveling domestically, driver's licenses and things. 
And one of the most interesting things is the new trend towards people identifying in a non-binary identity. Binary means up or down. It means one of two things, yes or no, up or down. Most of life is not binary. Um, things are not always either yes or no. They're not always black and white, they're gray. And it turns out that for many people, gender is not really a male and female and all men are men, men, men and all women are femi girls and things. And, and more and more people are saying that they identify with a non-binary identity and now 11 states are putting non-F, non-M gender markers on driver's licenses. And you'll see the passport agency is going to just have to do that soon. Um, we're pretty convinced of that, although this particular president, um, I don't like him. I um, <laughs> like the last guy better. But now, folks traveling with those non-M, non-F driver's licenses, sometimes it's an X, sometimes it's a U, sometimes it's a blank, sometimes it's a zero. Um, that gets people's, that gets uh, officials' uh, attention also. Um, and that can be a problem. One of the things we work on a lot that is a significant problem for trans people, and a lot of trans people I know will not travel simply because they will have to go through TSA checkpoints. And the TSA is, is just a real mess. And it starts with their, their asking for ID documents and what I just talked about. But then you go through a machine, and some of the machines still are the kind where the, the person has to push either the blue button or a pink button. They are literally blue and pink. And the computer makes an assessment of, of what you should look like within a range of things. So if you are, if they push the blue button because they assess you as male, the machine is expecting certain things on your chest and certain things in your genital area. And if it is not what it expects, the thing beeps and they have to check you. And then that's another whole dangerous and embarrassing, but mostly dangerous thing for trans people. Um, interestingly and amusingly, one of the first things we worked on when we started NCTE 16 years ago was with the TSA. Um, I had noticed that the TSA had a, a guide, guidelines online for um, people of the Sikh faith when they were traveling. So particularly sick men have headdresses um, and often carry a dagger for religious purposes near their heart. Um, it's just a small dagger, but, but after 9-11, that became a significant um, barrier to travel. So the TSA did a nice thing um, on, on traveling while sick and, and teaching their transportation security officers or TSOs about that. So I went to them and I said, you really need to do something like that for trans people. And I remember two things about that. Number one, they said, no, there's not that many of you. And two, within a week, they issued a similar document called Traveling with Your Service Animal Helper Monkey. Now, I don't want to make light of service animal helper monkeys because that's a, a serious thing for people who need that. Um, I will, however, make fun of the best uh, bureaucratic writing ever in the history of the universe in that guide where there was one sentence that said, transportation security officers, officers are trained not to touch your monkey. <laughs> so that was great. I think if I hadn't pointed that out to them, it would still be there. Um, bathrooms are, oh, oh and I, I just wanna explain how uh, hard this is with a personal story. I was in the Czech Republic crossing the border into Poland with my friend Lisa, who was also a trans woman, and her 80-year-old mother. And we were in a rented car, and uh, both Lisa and I had transitioned very recently, within a year or so. And we pulled up to this very back road kind of border crossing, and this guy sort of ambled out, and Lisa was driving, and he reached his hand out, and she handed him the three passports. And then he, he like opened them up and he looked and then he said, Mara. And Lisa pointed at me and he said, Mara? And I said, yes. And he was not speaking English and my Polish is like everybody else's Polish. <laughs> uh, pretty much unless you're from Poland, you're not speaking a lot of Polish. And uh, he went back inside to this little guard station, which is one of those little booths 
And he was in there for like 10 minutes, and we were making plans on what to do if they were going to detain me. And there was no real reason for them to detain me, and we knew this was probably a trans thing. So the guy comes back out with some other officer, and, and they come to my side of the car, and they're like, Mara. And I, the, the picture was only a couple months old. It looked like me. And I was like, yes. And the other person, and they, they weren't laughing or anything, but it was, it was something weird. They went back in. They were there for almost a half an hour, and we're alone on this dark road with an 80-year-old in the car, planning on how they were going to try to get away and get to an American embassy. And we were nowhere near any kind of American anything. Um, and it was really pretty terrifying. And it was, um, it was that passport I told you about. And I think that's something flagged. I, I don't know that they could speak or read English, but something was bad about that. And about 20 minutes later, they came out and they said, OK, you can go. Um, but that was really scary. And a lot of people have much worse um, problems than that. Um, but then I also want to tell you something else about that trip, which was really important a as a trans person. We then started driving into Poland. We were trying to find the village where Lisa's mother was from. Not, not to return her there, but to, <laughs> you know, have her visit. And um, which, by the way, was one really wonderful, wonderful adventure, doing the genealogy in advance and then on the fly and trying to find this little village that had been renamed multiple times in the 20th century because of the various wars. It's a fascinating, fascinating thing. But we crossed the border, and in a little bit, we got on a highway, and then we came to this place where there were lots of highway kind of stores alongside of it. And we found this place that looked kind of like Walmart, and we had to use the bathroom. So we went to the bathroom, and I don't know if you know about bathroom signs in Poland, because why would you? <laughs> but they are marked with either a circle or a triangle. Now, we, Lisa and I are there, and we're like, so the, particularly newer trans women, it is a very dangerous thing to be, or newer trans people, it's a very dangerous thing to be going into the wrong bathroom. And by the way, you might not know what the real bathroom should be where you are, and you have to um, there, there's a cartoon that a lot of trans people have up where the person's looking at these two bathroom doors and the one says, get beat up, and the other says, get arrested. <laughs> and, um, and that's sometimes how you feel, but suddenly you're in a foreign country and you have a circle and a triangle and you're, you really can't think of anything but what the fuck. <laughs> and so we stood around until other people went in and then we figured out that circle meant women and triangle meant men. Apparently the word for a slang word for women in Polish, like chick or babe or something, is very similar to the word for circle, and that's how it happened. I don't, again, my Polish is, that's all I know about Poland. Um, but, but these things really matter. Um, I, not to give anybody any grief, I don't mean this, but this is a thing. I had a staff person who was here the last day, um, and he texted me, he said, there's no gender neutral bathrooms. They forgot to do gender neutral bathrooms. That, really, that kind of thing really matters to trans people. Um, if there had been a gender neutral bathroom, which God only knows what shape that would have been, um, that would have really helped me out in Poland. So I, I, I just want to just note those things. You know, I'm a, I'm a very brave person. I'm an intrepid traveler. I've been to like, not a lot of countries, by American standards, a whole lot of countries, probably like 15 or 20 countries, including Poland, by the way, which is great. Um, and uh, I still worry about travel all the time. And my mother and father really, really worry about me traveling. Uh, and when you're thinking about maybe marketing to trans people, um, that's really important. We're having a retreat for executive directors of trans organizations next week in Fort Lauderdale. And we're sending somebody down a day early just to train the staff so that the person at the front desk doesn't call me sir, doesn't call you ma'am, doesn't, just doesn't mess up in that way. We're going to wrestle with them about bathrooms. We're going to have to talk to them about swimming pool attire. Um, and all that stuff really matters. And so I think what I would just suggest you all do before you think about recruiting trans travelers or marketing to them is you get yourself some trans people and actually talk to the real people. And, and here's why, and I'm going to close with this one story, and I swear this is a true story. These two mice die and go to heaven. <laughs> it's a true story. And St. Peter says, 
you guys were awesome mice. Welcome. I got you this big mouse mansion. Here's your little mouse car. Um, I don't think they got a car because that ruins the joke. <laughs> but you're going to love it here. The weather's great. There's all the food you want. Run, run around. Learn things. It'll be great. You're going to love it. He set them off. And about a week later, he ran into them. He's like, how do you like it? And they're like, it's really great, but our feet are so small. And so we were thinking, you know, maybe you could make this bigger. And they're like, no, no, no. I have a better idea, St. St. Peter. I'm going to give you roller skates. And they're like, yeah, well, we think maybe if you made us bigger, that would help. He's like, no, no, no. I think the idea you guys in roller skates is great. So we gave him roller skates. A week later, again, totally true, this cat died. And he comes up, and St. Peter says, cat, you were a great cat. You deserve to be in heaven. Here's your cat mansion. You know, here's all the food you could want. Everything's really great. A week later, he ran into the cat and said, how's it going? And the cat said, it's beautiful up here. I love it. I especially like the Meals on Wheels program. <laughs> it's a true story. The purpose of that parable is to let you know that when people don't get to have input into what is the best for them, they can sometimes get eaten. So as you are thinking about marketing to trans people or involving trans people in travel projects of whatever type, please consider talking to some trans people first. We at the National Center for Transgender Equality would be so happy to help you. And I wish I could tie it in and say something smart ass about a mouse now, but I just can't. I am so thankful to be here. I'm so thankful for the work you all do. And thanks to the association and John and the whole staff. Thank you very much.